of what was going on. That he thought she might have had a stroke. And then when he talked to me today, he said that um, the final, I guess the test finally came back of MRI of her brain. And they said that she did, in fact, have a stroke. So we do want to lift her up in prayer. And I, I asked him the question. I said, well, do they feel pretty confident that she'll rebound? And he said, oh, yes, oh, yeah. So um, most importantly, we want to continue to pray God to keep her strength up because one of the most difficult things when people get older is when they get sick and their strength fails. Those are a deadly combination. So do keep her in your prayers. We're going to keep on lifting her up, asking God to move mightily. We've got a lot of other folks in the church that are working and doing different things, some that are busy and some that are backslid and some that are cold on God. And so goes the way of a lot of the church today. And so uh, I don't know. I don't understand it for the life of me. And I often think to myself, if it grieves me so deeply that it feels like a knife stuck in you, it makes me wonder how God must feel. Can you imagine? Imagine if you were in the nursing home and you had a lot of children and none of them would come and visit you. I'm sure it's kind of the way it feels for the Lord whenever His saints won't gather together to exalt Him and learn of him and hear what he has to say i've often thought you know as a preacher there are some of you you like to cook and probably about as good as i like to preach i love to preach they used to mess with me over the years they said i'd preach at the drop of the hat and i'd drop the hat and i don't doubt that but as much as you like to cook well it can be very disappointing whenever you prepare a big meal and nobody wants to eat. So let's lift one another up in prayer tonight because I tell you, we could all use the encouragement. You, me, those that are not here. There are some times that people don't come to the house of God simply because they're going through a battle themselves. So there's very, very many reasons why people are in that state of mind. It's going to take a personal revival to get some people shook loose of where they are. My time of pastoring, I was just telling somebody this the other day. A particular loved one that they, they know. I said, it wasn't that long ago they were telling me God gave them a second chance. I said, where have they been? What happened? People quickly lose sight of how God spared them and what God's done. You don't have to look far. You can look in the Word of God and see what happens when we forget God. The Bible even talks about a nation that forgets God. Scripture does. We're going to look at something tonight that I hope will be a help to us. We've got those that are here listening tonight. We have some by the internet. So we're going to share what God has laid on my heart to share with you in your hearing tonight. Psalms chapter number 88, verse number 9. When you have it, if you will, stand to your feet. Say amen. We're going to read Psalm 88, verse 9. And we're going to read through to verse 15. So that's Psalm 88. Verses 9 through 15. You have it, say amen. The psalmist speaking here says, Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee, have stretched out my hands unto thee. Will thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Selah. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave with thy faithfulness in destruction? 
Shall thy wonders be known in the dark and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? If you haven't already realized by now, David is using a certain sense of sarcasm because God hasn't answered him yet. He says in verse number 13, But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Lord, why casteth thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. Now look at this last part here very closely. You looking? Verse 15. I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up while I suffer thy terrors. What does it say? I am distracted. I am distracted. I'd like to preach tonight with the help of the Lord on demonic diversions. Demonic diversions. Will you stretch your hand to the Lord tonight? And let's pray for God's will. Father, tonight I love you. I thank you for the word of God. And I praise you tonight, God, that you have anointed me. Even when I wasn't worthy, you've blessed, you've encouraged, you've helped. Tonight I need you. I need you to stand with me, work through me, speak through me, Lord, tonight. To speak the words of life to this congregation, anyone listening by the internet tonight. And we're going to give you praise for everything you do. And everyone can say amen tonight. And you can be seated in the presence of the Lord. For just a little while I'd like to talk to us about demonic diversions. A diversion is the diverting or the departing our attention or our focus of one thing by using something else to accomplish that. Anybody understand what a diversion is? The diverting of your attention using something to get your attention off of that and get it on something else. You understand that is a diversion. As I was getting ready tonight, I thought to myself, how much a diversion and a distraction are so much alike. But a distraction is a purposeful, intentional act to get a person's attention a lot of times off of one thing onto another thing when it's done in an active way. But when I look at this, I started kind of getting curious and wanted to better understand it. Knowing that a diversion is a departing or whatever of our attention and focus off of one thing, getting it onto something else. One such definition given in Webster's Dictionary, I believe explains the direction that I felt that God wanted us to cover tonight. The, Bible, or the Webster's Dictionary said it like this, it's something that takes attention away from what is happening. I want you to think about that for a minute. It is something that takes attention away from something that is happening. An event, anything that could be done, it takes the attention off of that and it puts the attention on something else. Everyone understand what a diversion is. It is taking the attention off of this and putting it over on something else. And I believe tonight that the devil is a master when it comes to diversion. But the definition of diversion being this, I also know that it is also to divert from a course or a direction. This is straight out of the dictionary. It's not just my commentary. I may add a few of my thoughts to it. But when you look at this on the surface, it is very simple. It is to take or to divert a course or a direction. So suppose tonight that spiritually speaking... You're going down spiritual I-4. You're headed in one direction. And all of a sudden the devil tries to get you off the wrong exit. And give you a diversion and get you distracted and going the wrong way. Over the years I have been driving down the road. And I'd be on the phone talking to somebody. 
In our modern day culture, they didn't have this back then, so they couldn't have used this example. But we can drive down the road and talk on a cell phone at the same time. And I've been driving down the road before and been on the phone talking to somebody and drove right on past where I was supposed to get off because what was happening on that cell phone had diverted my, my attention off of what I should have been doing on something else. And I believe it's important tonight more than you will know in this service what I'm about to preach uh, as, as far as your relationship in God, as far as the things the devil uses to get you tripped up and messed up. I believe this is more important than we may even realize when we look at our text, the psalmist is obviously overwhelmed by his unfortunate circumstance. Now, I don't want to spend a great deal of time talking about how the psalmist got here. I don't want to spend a great deal of time talking about how bad that it really was. I want to focus my attention on the diversion that was caused because of these circumstances. When we look at verse number 9, I can see him, you can see him crying. And the Bible shows him with his stretched out arms reaching out to God. And I see a man when he's got his arms stretched out. Imagine yourself down in prayer. You're down on your knees. You're praying. And you're talking to God. And you got your arms reached out to the Lord. Most likely you're simply or something like a child that is reaching up to God or reaching up to its mama and saying, Mama, would you help me? Does anyone understand that tonight? So in other words, whenever a man of God, whenever a person is reaching out to God, they've got their arms stretched out. It is also sending a message saying, God, would you allow me to crawl up into your bosom? Would you allow me the help I need you right now? Usually when a child has its arms up to its mama, it wants to be picked up. It wants to be nurtured. It wants something from that mama. Can you say amen tonight? And I believe that's the same place that David or this psalmist was in with his arms stretched out to the Lord crying out. We read in verse number 10 where he said, Will thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? I want you to understand, I don't believe that David meant anything negative towards the Lord. I don't believe that David was trying to purposefully be disrespectful to the Lord. But there was a certain tone of sarcasm to what David was saying. Because David said, Will thou show wonders to the dead? Because David felt like, Man, I haven't had an answer. Am I going to die before I get an answer? And, and, and Lord, are the dead, are, are they going to see the wonders of God? Are, you, are they going to have to wait till they die to see a miracle? Is that what's going to have to happen? He said, the, Shall the dead arise and praise thee, Selah? In other words, God, am I going to have to wait until I die and I'm in the grave before I can lift my hands and say, Thank God I got my breakthrough. Thank God He came through for me. Am I going to have to wait till this trial or this affliction overtakes me and I'm dead? When I look down at verse number 12, he said, Shall thy wonders be known in the dark and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? There's continually still a little vague undertone of sarcasm, sarcasm here. He says to the Lord, Is this going to be, uh, you know, your righteousness going to be shown in the land of forgetfulness? In other words, you forgot about me, Lord. You forgot that I needed you. You forgot that I was going through something. I'm down here, Lord, and I need your help right now. Any, everyone understand what David or this psalmist is going through right about now? He says in verse number 13, But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Verse number 14, Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Again, you can see the mounting frustration and he feels like God, maybe I just don't understand why that you have not moved just yet. Now let me say, say this because I believe that every single one of us, if we've been serving God for any length of time, 
have had times in our walk with the Lord that we wondered if God had forgot about us. Am I right, somebody? You've had times in your life when you got down and you prayed about a certain situation and then you go back, you check your bank account three weeks later and it's worse than it was three weeks ago. You get down and you pray and you say, God, it's a desperate need. I really need you to move. And then you get another doctor's report and this test is worse than the last one before you prayed. Or you get down, you pray, God save them. Get them out of the mess that they're in. Don't allow them to drive over there. Don't allow them to get yoked up with them. Don't allow them to marry that crazy guy. Don't allow this to happen. And you put that thing before the Lord and it seemed like before you'll ever see an answer to prayer that you may die before you ever get to see it. Anybody understand what I'm talking You've ever been there before. I prayed about this. I asked for it in the name of Jesus. But yet it has not happened just yet. And I believe that's exactly where the psalmist is right here tonight. But when I look at verse number 15, it's what he says in this verse that got this preacher's attention. I want to read verse 15 again to you. He says, I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. But I, while I suffer thy terrors, he says, I am distracted. Boy, that was almost like something that just jumped right off the page at me. While I'm suffering through all of this, while I am dealing with all of my circumstances, and while I have to fight the devil on the left, fight the devil on the right, discourage, my faith has taken a hard hit in all of this. I am distracted. Do you know tonight I believe that a great deal of the church has become distracted because of the many trials and afflictions that we are going through. I believe if it's not a temptation, if it's not a, an attack on our faith, there is something that has been dispatched out of the flames and the smoke of hell to cause us to get diverted, to cause our focus and our attention on the things that really matter, to get so sidetracked that all we can talk about is our lost loved ones and whether they're going to go to jail. Our lost loved ones and whether they're going to get a divorce. Our lost loved ones and whether or not they're going to ever pray through. That job that we're not sure whether we're ever going to get fired or whether they're going to let me go right before Christmas. You know what kind of things we fight. You understand what we face. Is this the final straw? Is this the way I'm going to go down? That's a exactly the way we feel a lot of times and in the midst of all of that the devil's got you looking at something else instead of looking full steam ahead at where God wants to take you I want you to understand folks if you've got a pilot in an airplane or you've got a captain on board a ship that man is responsible for the entire ship he's responsible for the entire plane every Everybody on board that ship is counting on him to navigate them to safety. Everyone agree with what I'm saying? And so because of that, every time that he's at that wheel, it's very important that he keeps his focus out the front window of that airplane. He's got to keep his focus on the compass if he is a boat or captain. He's got to keep his face towards the direction direction that he's headed in. He can't be back somewhere in the back of the boat. Uh, you know, get it on cruise control and get sidetracked with something else because if he does, his life is going to end and he may take a lot of people down with him. Do you understand tonight how important that it is for every husband that has a wife to be the man of God that his family needs him to be because God put him as the head of the house. God made him the man 
that is responsible for everybody else on that ship in that home. He has made him responsible for everybody on board that airplane. And if he walks away from the controls and he gets sidetracked with other stuff, there's going to be a catastrophe up ahead. Somebody say, God help us tonight. I believe that we're living in the last days and we're living in perilous times and we're living in a time when the men and women of God who should be being powerhouses pillars in the house of God are being distracted by the devil and allowing the devil to take them in the wrong direction. Somebody say amen. I don't know about you, but I'm absolutely sick of the devil. Somebody say that with me. I'm sick of the devil. I really am. Because everything that you're going through, everything I'm going through, is nothing more than a diversion to get our attention off of everything God's ever wanted us to do in the kingdom of God. For our life, every day that we live for the Lord, that devil's sneaking in and he's trying to do whatever he has to do to get your attention on something else. If normally you'd be praying, guess what? Your phone will be ringing right about when you should be praying. If normally you'd be reading your Bible and somebody be calling you on the phone. I need to talk to you right now. You know what I'm saying? Every time we turn around, there is a plan, an intentional plan of the devil to get you diverted. And I want you to understand tonight, it is the job of the child of God to make sure that we're not allowing the devil to force feed a situation or a circumstance that is going to get our eyes off the straight and narrow way. I want you to know it ain't easy. I mean, it ain't easy to keep your eyes on that road all the time. I mean, folks, we got fiery darts coming from the left and fiery darts coming from the right. We got them coming from before and from behind. Let me tell you tonight, I believe that these fiery trials that are coming at us, the word of God said, think it not strange. Though some fiery trials come to try you as though some strange thing happen and I tell you all it is it is an an intentional tactic of the devil to divert your attention off of everything you ought to be doing if God called you to do something he wants to get you out of that the devil wants you to get away from it and he wants to divert you back to where you were before you gave your heart to God say amen somebody I believe tonight it could be what what was going he was going through had taken his attention away and distorted his focus so badly that the psalmist was having problems believing that God would come through or that things would get better that's why that the man of God said while I suffer thy terrors I am distracted while I go through junk I am distracted I want you to know some folks David was just as much human as anybody sitting in this room and come on now I believe that David had an anointing and a calling on his life but when at the end of the day he was flesh and blood just like you and me and he fought the devil just like we do and he was at a point in his life he was about to give up and he got to that place because he got distracted and I tell us tonight just before a man or a woman gives up it's almost always going to be because they allowed themselves to get distracted I want you to know you can't afford to let the devil come along and blindside you and say look over here look over here do you know that's exactly what the devil wanted to do with the son of God when he prayed and he fasted if 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness and he took him up to a high pinnacle you know what the devil was trying to do the devil was trying to send a diversion because if the devil could keep him from the cross he would have but I'm glad tonight that the son of God set an example He set a precedent for the rest of the church and that precedent says I don't have to let the devil divert me. Amen. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's what he told the devil. I would to God that some of us would say get behind me, devil, in the name of Jesus.
Jesus, this thing you sent to cause me to get distracted ain't going to work. Somebody say amen tonight. Oh, yeah. I'm convinced tonight that the devil will use any and every means of negative circumstance in our life to divert our attention and focus off of God's plan for us, God's timing for us, God's calling for us, and God's concern for us. I believe that when he tries to divert God's plan for us and get our attention off of that, he's always taking us in some kind of direction. That's right. If you'll let the devil, he, he'll try to come along and get you rerouted because he knows that every one of us have a path. Every one of us tonight, the Lord is taking you somewhere in your life and the devil knows that and the devil wants to come along on this journey and tell you to get off at exit number 49 when God was going to have you get off at exit number 50. Everyone understand what I'm saying because he knows if he can foil the plan of God for your life, he can take not just you down, your family down, but others down in the process. Can you say amen? Oh yeah, but he'll also, I believe he'll try to take the attention off of God's timing for us. If we only knew when and what he was going to do. I got to thinking about this. And I want you to know my heart was overwhelmed and heavy thinking of how the devil tries so hard to get us to get our attention off of God's timing for us. That's what he was doing with the psalmist. He wanted him to get his attention off God's timing for him. Because the devil wants you to think God's never coming through. This ain't never going to happen. It ain't never going to get any better. That's just the way the devil works. He wants to get your attention off of God's timing for you. He wants to get your attention off of God's calling for you. You see, I've seen people before that because God didn't do it in a few minutes, if it didn't happen in a year and a half, hell man, it must not be God's will for me to do thus and so. If God called you to be a foreign missionary, if it takes ten and a half years for you to get there, God's going to get you there. You can't get diverted and get your attention taken off of the will of God in the process. you got to make up your mind. I'm staying this course because I know who's leading the ship. Say amen, somebody. But the devil wants to get our attention off of God's concern for us. Do you know that's one of the biggest ones of all? The devil wants you to get your focus off the fact that God cares where you are. Ain't that the reason why the psalmist here is telling us in so many words, God, am I going to have to wait to praise you from the land of forgetfulness? Am I going to have to wait till I'm dead? Amen, and praise you when I'm dead for my breakthrough. I want you to know that devil was doing everything he could to get David's attention off the fact that God cared about him. That's exactly the way the devil's done for thousands of years. Look at here, God don't care about you. The, the Lord don't care about what's going on in your life. But how many tonight says I know better than that? We say that publicly. We say that out loud. But when you go through a trial it's so easy for that old sly devil to slide right up beside you and say he don't care about you. Oh, he don't care anything about you. Don't matter. He's not going to come through for you. How many of you tonight says, I believe otherwise? And God help me in my deepest, darkest dilemma to believe the truth. There are some of you tonight, it's easy right here on these pews. While I'm preaching, to go, oh, that's right, preacher. God's concerned about me. And I can guarantee you this. There are people that have taken their life that at some point in their life actually believe that God cared about them. What happened? What changed? I want to tell you what changed. A diversion, a demonic diversion came along one day 
got their attention on something else, got them thinking about something else, and caused them to believe that God didn't care anymore. How I many knows that's nothing more than a lie of the devil? Say amen, somebody. But I believe this use of diversion against an opponent, it is well known, known among most people in the natural. We've got sports teams. If you know much about sports, this tactic of diversion is a real popular tactic. It is to get a touchdown, to get a hoop or a three-point shot, for them to be able to run a, a home run. They can get some kind of diversion. In some sports, they even use that ter type of terminology, and it's to try to trick the other team into thinking that they got the ball when really they don't got the ball. The other guy on the other end of the field has the ball. That's a diversion. It's not just in sports, but thieves have used diversion. When they go into a jewelry store and they're getting ready to steal, they may get a diversion and make a, the person that's looking at jewelry think that somebody else is doing something to get their attention off the person robbing them over here. And that's a diversion. That's exactly how the devil works. Uh, not just that, but I've had salesmen that they'll come along, they'll tell you, oh yeah, that's the nicest car on the lot. They won't. They don't want you to look at the leaking oil coming out the bottom of the motor. They don't want you to see that the tires are bald as an onion. Uh, and they don't want you to see the fact that the paint on the roof is fading. So you know what they'll do? They'll divert your attention uh, to the things that they like about the car. Boy, don't this car run good. Uh, didn't it shift nice? Uh, boy, this thing's got some nice leather interior. Come on, somebody, you're helping me. It's a diversion to divert your attention off the real thing. That's exactly what the devil is doing tonight. Uh, but the thing is, uh, a lot of people don't understand long 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 before that any sports team any thief or car salesman ever knew the tactic of diversion the devil had this thing down pat a long time ago in the garden of Eden how many remembers in the garden of Eden with Adam and Eve he used that tactic of diversion to cause Eve to sin in the garden of God he got her focused off of everything she could have and got it on the one tree she couldn't have. Did you hear me somebody? It was a tactic of diversion. He was showing her everything she could couldn't have was one little tree. I don't want you to see the thousands of other trees you can have. Look at that one tree you can't have. That's diversion and that's exactly the way the devil works. That's the reason why the lust of the flesh is such a powerful, powerful thing. You ever heard the chase? I've met men in my time. I've met a few women like this too. But I've met some men in my time. That they always want to chase. And when they got what they wanted, they'd be chasing something else. I've met men before that had a beautiful wife and be chasing some woman. Well, I'll just put it nicely. She wasn't as beautiful. But he couldn't have her. He already has this one. And that's exactly the way the devil was working with Eve. See what you can't have? And that's the way the enemy works in our life. I believe tonight that the biggest thing we miss is that behind these things is a spirit. I want you to hear me tonight. Behind every lustful deed, behind every evil act, is a spirit behind that. And you allow those spirits to come into your life and rule and operate and take charge and take control. And the next thing you know, you've sold yourself out just like Eve did to the devil. No, preacher, I still go to church. Let me tell you something. If you give up, if you compromise, you let in for the devil to appease your flesh and what we do don't glorify God in no way, we better back up and say, God, have I been diverted? Am I a product of the devil's demonic diversion? Has the devil got my attention on something that ain't even important? Come on, somebody. 
I want you to understand, folks, tonight, it is the will of God for us to make sure that we are guarding the borders of our hearts. Say amen. We read a very familiar story of diversion when Jacob stole Esau's blessing by disguising himself as Esau, his brother. With the help of his mother, while his brother went to take care and fix and catch the venison and bring it back to his father, Isaac. His mother said, come on and help me just do what I tell you to do. He said, I'll fix up some stuff and we'll bring it back. Their plan was a plan of diversion to get daddy who's eyesight wasn't what it used to be and he couldn't see and there he laid waiting to be able to bless the oldest son the oldest son's out in the field while the youngest son is making a plan of diversion up with mommy he says to his mom mom I cannot this is not going to work dad is going to impart on me a curse instead of a blessing because my brother is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth-skinned man. Dad will know the difference. You know what? He almost didn't get away with it. Because when he came in, stood by his daddy. His daddy looked up and said, come here and let me feel you. Because your voice, your voice sounds like Jacob. But he said, you feel like Esau. Because his mama had took some animal skins and put him on it to make it feel like he was his brother. Because his brother was a hairy man. It was an absolute all-out plan of diversion. When his brother came in from the field to actually bring what his daddy asked for. Is when his daddy and his brother realized he had already gave the blessing. To the wrong brother. Let me tell you that's exactly how the devil operates. Deceit and diversion. To divert the attention and to divert the path of what is right. Somebody say God help us tonight. And then there was a woman by the name of Delilah. She was not a God loving professing kind of person. She was of the Philistine people. And here we've got one woman who was able to take down a man that thousands of men could not take down. You know what she used? Diversion. Did you get a hold of that? Don't sit here and think for one minute that it was a coincidence whenever David looked out his bedroom window and saw Bathsheba in another window bathing. That was a plan of diversion set up by the devil. But Delilah is like the devil and she's got Samson laying his head in her lap and we see that she diverted Samson's attention away from his covenant with God as she questioned him of his love for her. She used how much he loved her as a way of getting his attention off the covenant that he had made with God. Do you know tonight you might have been a Nazarite since birth. It don't matter. You might have been holiness to the bone for 10 years. It won't matter if you get messed up with a plan of diversion. I'm going to tell you some folks, uh, that devil knows exactly what every one of our weaknesses are. And if he can use that, he'll formulate a recipe to take you out. He knows what ingredients to put in it. He knows just what to say. He knows to put you where to put you at the right time and who to put in your way. And he knows how to set you up. That's the reason why tonight there's a lot of folks that don't go to church because they say somebody hurt me. Yeah, because the devil set a plan of diversion up and put the wrong hypocrite in their path because he knew that's what it would take to divert them in the wrong direction. And today they don't serve God, not because, of a not because of a hypocrite, but because of a plan of diversion to divert their attention 
off of why they started serving God in the first place on some hypocrite. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? I got to thinking about this. I'm going to show you something. And I want you to put yourself in the reality of this. Come here, Justin, for a minute. I'm going to use you for a minute. Brother Benefield, come here for a minute. I want to use you to help me. I try not to hold you and use it too long. I want you to stand here, face that direction. And I want you to pretend like you're working, like you're shoveling, hammering, do whatever. Just pretend like you're real busy working, okay? Now, Brother Benefield, you're going to be kind of like the devil. But you're not the devil. You're just another person. This is a lot like real life situation because I've had this happen. You got your phone with you? Boy, you got to have that with you. Yeah, it's right there. Pull it off. Yeah. You put it up by your head. Okay? It's a hello? Yeah. Oh, boy. Sound like a bad situation, don't it? Yeah. They probably want to yeah, They probably want to talk to Justin, too, huh? Come on over here. Keep it on your head. Justin's over here busy. He's working. What are you digging? You digging a big hole? You got a reason why you're digging, though, right? You, people don't normally just dig, unless they're five or three. They don't normally dig for no reason. They, you get old, you dig for a reason, I promise. But you're digging. You got a purpose here. And here comes Brother Benefield. And Brother Benefield grabbed him by his arm and said, Hey, buddy. He said, What you doing? He said, Well, I'm in the process of digging over here. He said, Hang on a second. Let me tell you, I got so and so on the phone over here. And they got to tell me about something going on down the street. And uh, hang on just, just a minute right here. Walk over here with me and sit down while I talk to him over here. And Justin's thinking to himself, man, I got stuff to do, but he don't want to be disrespectful. And so he come on over here, and Brother Benefield's going to talk to him and tell him, oh, yep, they just told me this, and they just said that, and they just said the other. And so the whole time, what are you not doing? You're not digging. All right? I'm going to show you something very simple from this illustration. Very simple, okay? The same way that Brother Benefield, I used him to go get his attention and get his attention over here. There are times that we go through trials and tribulations. And we're going to say tonight, you're a trial. You can put your phone away. But Justin, go back over there digging. Working, digging. Okay, you're busy about your life. Here comes a trial, diversion. It's a trial, a storm. Something's going on in your family. Everybody's arguing, everybody's mad at each other. And that trial gets a hold of you and drags you way over here. What are you not doing? digging you know how often that in the real that this happens you know how many people have quit the race because of this you know how many people are supposed to be digging tonight and they ain't and look around you because the enemy come along and use some kind of diversion to get you sidetracked if it isn't our families, our jobs, our friends, our hobbies, somebody said something, something I don't like me, all this kind of crazy garbage is a diversion. You know what I say? If I'm going to serve God, I'm going to serve God no matter what. If tomorrow the state office called and said, Pastor Myers, we're going to have to move you. You can't pastor there no more or whatever. You know what? I've got a God to serve. Whether I pastor here or pastor in somewhere in the middle of Alaska, i got a God to serve. So no matter what you go through, you've got to serve the Lord. You cannot allow the enemy to get your focus off of what's important. You could be over here, stay right there. You could be over here and you're trying to serve the Lord. You're trying to keep your faith and your focus. Keep digging. And then all of a sudden, we're going to call you sickness. Okay? Sickness comes along. 
sickness gets a hold of you and tries to divert you. Huh? Or we're going to say your depression. Okay? Depression gets a hold of you. Like sickness and other things. It gets you over here. And I'm going to just lean against the table. I want you to look like you're real depressed. Like you're real sad. And the, and the thing about it, whenever people get to a certain point, you don't even have to hold them there no long. Because whenever you've sunk down in enough depression, you're going to look over there. You're going to think about all the stuff you ain't done. You're going to think about how bad you've messed up. You're going to think about what people are going to say about you because you ain't been busy and you haven't been working for the Lord. You see over there where you used to dig? All it took was a little diversion to get you over here lean against this little table and you've been without digging so long you don't even feel like digging now. You feel like you're so far behind. You know what's even worse than that? Is whenever you got somebody over here and they're digging like a mad fiend. You're watching what they're doing. And you're looking over there and you look at what you've accomplished. And you look at what they've accomplished and you think, well, I don't even know why I'm doing this. I don't even know why I'm in this. I don't even know why I try. You see, a diversion got you here. But that's not what's keeping you here. You've allowed yourself to sink down into a place where you just feel like you're ready to quit. You can't stay there. At some point, you have to make up your mind. I'm going to go back over here. I might not be digging as much as brother so-and-so, and and I may not be as good as sister what's-her-name, but I want you to go back to digging, okay? This time, when a diversion comes along, gets a hold of your arm, it's trying to pull you. You shake your head no. No. How many remember the story in the Bible? I'm going to try to close with this. Where the man of God, as the old song goes, I'm building up this wall and I won't come down. The enemy stopped by and the enemy was trying to get him to come down off of that wall. They hadn't long come back from Babylonian captivity and they had fought like that and the man of God's looking at him like, Buddy, it took me too long to get to where I'm at. The Bible tells us that with one hand they built the wall and with another hand they fended off the enemy. I'm building up this wall and I won't come down. The song goes, The devil stopped by today just to have a little talk with me. He said, you're working way too hard. Come on down and rest your feet. I couldn't even stop to take the time to turn around because I'm building up this wall and I won't come down. You see, saints of God have known what this was all about for years. But unfortunately, we quit preaching it as much around the church. And what's happening, we got lots of folks that are laying by the wayside. Those that have taken another path or another direction and have allowed some demonic diversion to get them off the path that God put them on. Y'all can sit down tonight if you will. I just want you to understand what's at stake. Because it's very easy for you to look at your situation and think, well, I won't lose very much. But don't let what's going on right now in your life cloud your mind and divert your path. I read in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 2, it said this, That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as the day of Christ is at hand. You can't let your mind be shaken. You've got to be sober in your mind. You've got to keep your face set like a flint. Of the purpose and the goal of why you serve the Lord. Because I can promise you there's a lot of things fighting. We'd like to take away everything God's ever done in you. Everything God's ever made you. You see the diversion usually takes hold in our mind. I want you to listen to this. First Peter 1 and 3. 
He says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. First, Col- First Col- Colossians here, Corinthians seven thirty-five. You listening? And this I speak for your own profit, that I may cast a snare upon you. Not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely. And that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Did everyone get that? That you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Wow. Wow. Because the devil's doing everything he can to get your attention on so many things that aren't benefiting you in any way, shape, or form, worried about stuff that ain't going to change by you sitting around worrying about it. How do you know? Because I've been there. Stand to your feet tonight. I'm going to go ahead and give you an altar call tonight to be able to spend some time down on your face before the Lord, down on your knees or calling out on God and asking the Lord for His help. Because we're, we're serving a real God, but we're also fighting a real enemy who wants to destroy you. You've got to make it up in your mind tonight. I will, I will finish this race one way or the other. Will you come to this altar tonight? Come on, let's pray. God, teach me how to attend upon the Lord without distraction. God, help me to serve you without anything hindering me, diverting my attention, causing me to fall to the left or to the right. God, I need you right now. If that's you, I want you to pray. I want you to ask the Lord to help you tonight. God, I really, really need you. I need you to help me know what I should do, the direction that I should take. I need you to show me, God. Help us this this evening, Lord. We really, really need it. Jesus, we need it tonight, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, with your help, I...